A ver, ¿me escucháis bien? Pido disculpa porque no tengo exactamente voz de locutora de radio hoy. Eh, estoy resfriada. <laughs> pues uh, espero que no me falle la voz. Um, I'll switch to English for this talk, if you don't mind. So uh, today what I would like to focus on is our effort to finally make uh, MIC, which is this uh, notoriously undruggable target, uh, um, finally tractable in the clinical practice. Um, MIC has been known for a very long time as a pleiotropic prescription factor. Um, it's involved uh, in the regulation of different... Uh, uh, so I was just saying that uh, it can control up to 25% of the genes uh, in a cell. And it, it usually does so in very specific situations. Uh, MIC is basically absent uh, in quiescent cells, but when we have a wound, when we need to proliferate, then MIC gets induced and it does its job uh, in, in, instructs the cells to divide. And then when the job is done, MIC basically gets degraded. It's usually around only for 20 minutes, does its job and it disappears. However, in cancer, this is not true. The switch is completely lost and MIC is around all the time and basically instructs the cells to keep proliferating even when they don't have to proliferate. It's very unusual compared to other oncogenes because we are normally um, attacking uh, oncogenes that are mutated in cancer, assuming that they are the real drivers of tumorigenesis. However, MIC is an exception because it's uh, very seldom mutated itself. What happens is that it's normally induced by other mutations that we find in cancer, such as you know, EGFR, KRAS mutation, PI3 kinase mutations. They all use MIC inside the nuclei as their main transcription factor that execute all the transcriptional programs that allow cancer cells to divide, to build the proper microenvironment to thrive. For example, MIC is responsible for the production of new blood vessels in uh, tumor cells. And last but not least, MIC is also responsible for immune suppression. Cancer cells that have high MIC also have high PDL1 and high CD47. So all these molecules that say, don't see me, don't eat me to our immune system. So you can imagine that because of all these functions, we always thought that inhibited MIC would be beneficial in our fight against cancer. However, for a very, very long time, MIC has been considered an undruggable target. And the reasons for that is that, uh, well, it's mainly a technical reason. MIC is an intrinsically disordered protein. What does that mean? That it's a protein that changes shape all the time, all the time in solution. So using a small molecule to attack it is like to design a key for a lock that changes shape all the time. You can imagine that that is particularly tricky. The other reason is that uh, it resides in the nuclei and not all drugs can reach the nuclei or penetrate the nuclear membrane then we know that it doesn't have an active site. It's not an enzyme, so it doesn't have an enzymatic pocket that we can target. And uh, um, the MIC family actually comprises three different proteins, C-MIC, N-MIC, and L-MIC, and they can replace each other in some situations. So we'd better inhibit them all. And last but not least, when I started working on this, people told me, look, MIC is so important for tissue maintenance and tissue proliferation that inhibiting MIC will cause catastrophic side effects in normal tissue. However, when I looked in the literature for this last thing, you know, these catastrophic side effects, I didn't find any. Nobody had tried for fear of these catastrophic side effects. Nobody had done the experiment. So when I was a student, I decided to at least try in culture, no? in tissue culture. And uh, in order to design my first MIC inhibitor, I focused on these uh, specific biological aspects of MIC here. And MIC, in order to function, needs to form dimers with this uh, partner called MAX. When it forms these dimers, it's not intrinsically disordered anymore, but it forms uh, the structure that you see on the right side of the slide which is called the basic helix lupilis lucid zipper. You see, MIC and MAX uh, together form this forceps 
that can bind DNA. And so as a student, I thought, if I want to inhibit MIC, I can either disrupt MIC and MAX interaction or disrupt their interaction with the DNA. And I was very lucky because I managed to do both things at once. I essentially designed a fake MAX, an alternative partner for MIC, which I called OMOMIC. As you can see there on the top of the slide, OMOMIC is only the basic helix lupidic solution zipper of the human scenic protein in which I put four amino acidic substitutions. Because of these four amino acidic su substitutions, while MIC can only form dimers with MAX, OMOMIC can do much more. OMOMIC can uh, form dimers with wild type MIC. And these dimers cannot bind DNA anymore. Let's see whether I can, yeah. So the OMOMIC MIC dimer doesn't recognize DNA anymore. At the same time, OMOMIC can form homodimers and heterodimers with MAX. They can bind DNA, but they don't have any transactivation domain. So they are silent dimer. They shut down the transcription of genes that they bind. So here we have two mechanisms of action. The active sequestration of MIC away from DNA and occupancy of the DNA with dimers that basically shut down transcription. Something that again, with small molecules you cannot achieve. <clears throat> Over the years, MIC has been, uh, OMOMIC has been validated as a fan MIC inhibitor by us and by other groups. So it inhibits the old MIC family at once. And when I used it in cells, I saw that it killed cancer cells, but not normal cells. So I was all very excited, but people told me, be careful. If you want to show that this is something useful, you have to do it in animals. And for me, that was a critical moment because I was an animalist, uh, you know, one of these uh, animal rights people that didn't want to work with animals. Uh, and um, I, I had this first crisis in my career. I didn't know whether I wanted to do it. But then I had to trust uh, my results. I was killing cancer cells and not normal cells. So I went to the States, to San Francisco, to University of California, San Francisco, where I worked in the laboratory of Gerald Devon. And there I made my first OMOMIC mouse, a mouse that had OMOMIC under a tetracycline responsive promoter. So it was a doxycycline inducible, tetracycline or doxycycline inducible mouse because it was crossed with a mouse that had a reverse tetracycline transactivator, uh, which uh, basically could uh, induce uh, omomic in all the tissues of the animal, just adding doxycycline to the drinking water of the animal. So the animal normally didn't have any omomic. When I added doxycycline to the water, they would start producing omomic in all the tissues of the body. This was the first model of an anti-mic drug in a mouse. So um, I crossed this mouse uh, with a very well, um, mod very well uh, renowned model of uh, lung tumorigenesis, uh, the lock stop lock KRAS G12D model created by uh, Tyler Jacks uh, in, uh, in, sorry, by Dave Tuison in, in Tyler Jacks lab. This model is basically a knocking model. So the endogenous KRAS is replaced by this active, active um, constitutively active KRAS because it has the G12D mutation that you are very familiar with. But it's preceded by a stop cassette that can be removed by pre recombinase. So if we give the mice adenovirus that has the pre recombinase, they inhale it, the virus goes into the lung and activates KRAS. So these mice develop hyperplasia and adenomas by four, six weeks of age. Uh, sorry, for six weeks after the intranasal administration, and carcinomas by 16, 26 weeks. These animals develop hundreds of tumors in their lung, but we have the possibility of turning on omomic with doxycycline. So we turned it on for three days, and the effect was stunning. All the tumors shrunk in only three days. This was really mind blowing for us because we expected, if anything, that maybe we could stop the growth of the tumors, but definitely not shrink them. And it was even better when we treated the animals for one week. The tumors disappeared in one week, simply adding doxycycline to the water of these animals. 
uh, and we published this in Nature in 2008 because it was just the first proof of concept that immediate mix would be extremely, extremely effective against at least this type of lung tumors. And also we showed that if we treated the animals only once with Omomix, we could get this survival advantage that you can see in blue. But if we treated them metronomically on and off several times, the tumors would disappear completely and the animals would stay alive for more than one year without any tumor, as you can see here. Also, the big change in paradigm was shown regarding the side effects. We were able to show that the normal tissues in these animals simply slowed down their proliferation. They didn't suffer. So if you shave the animals, for example, you would see that the hair would regrow more slowly, but who cares? The hair doesn't fall, it only grows more slowly. We saw that there was a transient anemia, for example, because of slowdown of bone marrow, but it was immediately compensated by exolocation of hematopoiesis to the spleen. So the normal tissues were readjusting without any particular side effects for, for the animals. So we had an extraordinary therapeutic impact against the tumor, accompanied by this excellent therapeutic window in normal tissue. This was really a change in paradigm and people around the world started working towards creating their own MIC inhibitor. However, again, I was very excited and I started talking about this, but they told me, you are working with something that is too easy. This is a tumor that has only one mutation. Human tumors are a completely different story. So by that time, I was uh, planning to come back to Europe and I chose the Val de Bron here um, to start working back here in Europe. And uh, I repeated the whole experiment in the absence of P53, the guardian of the, of the genome. In the absence of P53, these tumors besides KRAS start accumulating additional mutations and the tumors are much more aggressive. Every single tumor has a different set of mutations here and they become really, really fast growing. And they be, you know, create these huge masses in the mouse lung. Despite these different mutational profiles, MIC, uh, sorry, MIC inhibition by OMOMIC was absolutely effective. The difference was that instead of one week, it took one month to clear the, the tumors. And you can see the tissue remodeling here because you have to get rid of these masses. So you see a lot of hemorrhage here because of uh, tissue remodeling. And again, uh, the metronomic treatment with homomic kept the animal tumor free indefinitely. So despite these additional mutations, we didn't see any emergence of resistance to MIC inhibition. So at least in this context, uh, and we published this in 2013, MIC seemed to be a unique and non-redundant function around which tumors cannot evolve. Uh, by that time, um, I was trying to, to work on uh, uh, tumor samples from the hospital and I got involved in a project regarding brain tumors in particular uh, with, in collaboration with Joan Sioane. I had started working on glioblastoma. There was a rationale for this because MIC expression is correlated with glioma grade. So we thought that this was a tumor worth looking at. I was working with a um, transgenic model in which uh, a mutated Harviras was driven by the GFAP promoter. So under an astrocytic specific promoter. And so I crossed this uh, with our omomic mouse. And uh, I just want to show you these uh, animals develop intracranial pressure first um, and start having headache and they become aggressive with their litter mates, so they have to be separated. But at some point they stop eating, they stop grooming, they go in a corner and everything bothers them in their life. So this is usually the ethical endpoint for the experiment. You can see that the animal doesn't respond to any stimulus. So, uh, so it's the ethical, and point unless we can have uh, um, a therapy for these animals. So we started giving them doxycycline. Again, these animals don't want to drink. So we had to squirt the doxycycline in their mouth. 
And this is the same animal one week later. Now it's eating, grooming, drinking, and it's uh, responding to stimuli like a normal mouse would be. And again, this was for us so, so exciting. Uh, we saw that uh, the, the brain that uh, normally is full of astrocytes, the astrocytes here are in brown. So you can see that there are astrocytes all over the brain. After the treatment with Omomix, the astrocytes are mainly eliminated throughout the, the, the brain. There are still some residual regions here uh, that are undergoing apoptosis, actually. When we checked, we saw that uh, they were basically dying astrocytes. And uh, one thing that we noticed was that uh, these regions uh, were full of polynucleated cells. We thought that it was a, you know, some sort of artifact of the fixation of the, the tissues, but it was happening only in the omomixated animals. So we filed this as interesting, but we don't know why it's happening. However, in the meantime, somebody in Italy, Emilia Favuzzi in the laboratory of Sergio Nasi, was working with glioma human uh, cell lines. And uh, uh, she had used the uh, omomic, transgenic omomic, that was an omomic GFP. That's why you see it in green. And she was seeing that the cells that were expressing omomic GFP had this polynucleated phenotype, like what we were seeing in the brain. So she started looking at mitosis in these cells. And she saw that uh, these glioma cells, glioblastoma cells that had omomic, had all defects in their mitosis. So that was particularly interesting to us and was indicating that there was some sort of mitotic crisis in these cells. In the meantime, at the Val de Bron, I had the chance to work with patient-derived samples. These are patient-derived tumor spheres. Jonathan Whitfield in the lab started transfecting them with an antivirus expressing omomic. And we looked at them, how they could generate tumors in uh, patient-derived xenograft. These are the control animals. So they start developing uh, a neurological symptom and need to be sacrificed. And these are the omomic treated animals. Just to make sure, that, uh, this um, mouse that we lost, we lost it during an IV imaging because of anesthesia problems. When we dissected this mouse, it never showed glioblastoma. So we were able to publish these results in 2014. Uh, and uh, we showed that uh, omomic could be a therapeutic option for this type of tumors. And we revealed a new role of MIC in proficient mitosis in glioblastoma. Since then, we have expanded the use of omomic to different types of, um, of uh, uh, tumors driven by different mutations in different tissues with similar results. But we wanted to make this something useful for patients. And this was the biggest challenge. There were reviews out there by experts in the field that were saying that omomic would never be a drug. These are statements taken from reviews. Omomic is a molecule too big and bulky to be directly delivered to cells. Somebody else wrote, omomic is essentially just a proof of concept and can only work as gene therapy. I was wondering why this is a 91 amino acid protein. It's not such a huge protein. You know, antibodies are much bigger than this. Why were they so sure that it couldn't be used as a drug? And um, in 2012, somebody in Canada, in Schoenbrook, Pierre Lavigne, published a paper showing that Max, the BHLH zip of Max, the partner of MIC, you remember, can penetrate cells spontaneously and exert some anti mic activity. So Max and Mick are and Omomic are very similar, not only in terms of structure, but also in terms of sequence. So I thought, if Max can penetrate cells, why couldn't Mick, Omomic do it? And if not, maybe you can modify it to make it a little more similar to Max, so that we can use it as a directly deliverable protein. So I was very lucky. I hired somebody from Pierre Lavigne lab, Maria Polio, who came as a postdoc in my lab. And she started producing gomomic as a recombinant protein in E. coli. So we are not using it as a transgene anymore. We are using it as a recombinant protein, okay? So she labeled it with a fluorescent uh, tag, Pizzi in green, 
and she added it to cells in culture. Look, in 15 minutes, 20 minutes, all the cells become green. So omomic penetrates cells, not only penetrates their nuclei. We were able to see this protein just finding its way to the nuclei. So we were able to patent uh, these cell penetrating uh, peptides uh, in 2013. Uh, these uh, peptides uh, or mini proteins can penetrate cells, uh, cross the nuclear membrane and reach NIC, causing selective cancer cell death, but not normal cell death. So we patented the use of these mini proteins in medicine in cancer in 2013. We were able to do it despite the fact that my first uh, a publication with Omomic was in 1998, specifically because uh, this, uh, these reviews out there were saying that Omomic would never be used as a drug. So I was able to show novelty compared to the state of the art because people didn't believe that this could happen. So uh, in 2014, December 2014, so beginning of 2015, with Mariav, we founded Peptomic which is the spin-off company from the lab to develop this uh, uh, for using patients. But we had to show what this mini protein was able to do. So we looked at it uh, in cells first. Uh, these are non-small cell and cancer cells mostly, but we did it in different cancer cells. And we saw that we could use this protein with an IC50 in the low micromolar range. Why is this important? because it's the minimum to, for the development into a drug. If we had a higher IC50, this could not be a drug, okay? So we are just at the threshold. This is uh, a concentration that can be developed into a drug. And the, the outcome is always the same. The cells are arrested or die as a consequence of homomic treatment, only cancer cells. Again, normal cells do not have this phenotype. But we had to show that this was happening, not because we were pumping the cells with a big and bulky protein. We had to show that this was due to really to NIC inhibition. So what we did was to look at NIC on DNA. This is chip seq So you can see in dark here, the peak corresponding to NIC bound to the target promoters. So you can see here NIC sitting on the promoter of its target gene. And below the effect of omomic. So you can see a clear reduction of the binding of NIC. If you see this genome wide here, these are the control cells in which in red, you can see uh, MIC next to the transcription starting site of the target gene. And next to it, the amomic treatment. It basically displaces MIC from more than 97% of its target genes. And this corresponds to a transcription reprogramming because the MIC fingerprint is shut down completely by the treatment with homomic. Again, here I'm showing you no small cell lung cancer cells because at the time we were working with those, but we saw this in all the tumor cells. And this was specific for MIC because other BHLHZ proteins involved in lung tumorigenesis are absolutely not affected. So we are on target and specifically on target. So encouraged by these in vitro results, we wanted to see whether the mini protein could be used in vivo. Again, we were working with non-small cell lung cancer, so we thought that we could do topical administration. Also because we were told that proteins would be degraded very quickly in the bloodstream. Normally, peptides have a 20-minute half-life in the bloodstream. So to avoid the bloodstream, we decided to uh, treat the animals intranasally, so with a drop of omomic. And in one hour, this is um, a fluorescent omomic. In one hour, the whole lung was positive for omomic, but we were very surprised because other organs were also positive. The brain was positive, liver, pancreas, kidney, intestine. So omomic was traveling through the bloodstream to reach these other organs. But I'll get back to it. So we, we started treating animals that had lung adenocarcinoma, KRAS driven adenocarcinomas. And uh, we had another very nice surprise. So this is radioactive omomic 24 hours after the administration. And I hope you can see this. 
the 24 hours after the administration, uh, the normal tissue has washed, up, washed off uh, omomic, but omomic is retained in the tumors. So this was the basis for finding a patent for the use of omomic as a tracer for lung tumors, as a teragnostic for lung tumors. And uh, one thing that we really liked was that uh, we detected 48 hours after the administration as much omomic in the lung as uh, we were seeing at the very beginning, 30 minutes after the administration. So it was persisting there. It wasn't being eliminated quickly by the tumor tissue. So we started treating animals, as I was saying, with uh, lung adenocarcinoma. These are longitudinal studies uh, in vehicle-treated animals and in omomic-treated animals. This is the onset and four weeks later. In the vehicle-treated animals, all the tumors have grown during this time, and some tumors have, have even appeared de novo. But in the omomic-treated animal, no tumor shows significant growth. This is the relative quantification. So this is the control, and this is the, this is the omomic treated animals. So we thought that we had reached cytostatic effect. We had stopped the growth of the tumors. But the pathologist called us and said, come and look at this. Actually, as we expected, all the vehicle treated animals have adenocarcinomas, or almost only adenocarcinomas. But the omomic treated animals had regressed more than 50% percent of the cases to adenomas or even hyperplasia. So this is more than just a cytostatic effect. And we saw that it was the result of reduced proliferation seen by ki 637 increase in apoptosis seen by cleft phase 3. And we also saw something really, really cool. These tumors are normally immune deserts. KRAS driven no small cell lung cancer is usually not infiltrated with T cells. But after the treatment with omomic, we saw a significant increase in uh, um, CD3 positive cells, so in, in T cells. And uh, um, I'll get back to this, but this basically prompted us to check whether we could combine omomic with immune oncology. This was intranasal though. And when we started talking about intranasal administration of omomic, people criticized us for that. They said, you cannot reach all the organs intranasally and uh, this is not going to be very well controlled in terms of dosing. So we switched to intravenous administration, again, with the fear that omomic would be degraded in the blood very quickly. And instead, we observed a half-life of almost 50 hours in the blood with omomic. So we started treating uh, a xenograft model in this case uh, for non-small cell lung cancer that was EGFR mutated, PI3 case mutated, P53 mutated, and was resistant to the standard of carotenoid. We didn't have much for this type of tumor in the lab. Chemo almost doesn't do anything to these cells. So we started treating them once a week with omomic, with 30 milligram per kilo with omomic, and we had this nice therapeutic effect. First, there was um, slowdown in tumor proliferation, and by the third, four week of treatment, we started seeing the tumor shrinking. This, uh, uh, no small cell lung cancer work was published in 2019 in Science Translational Medicine. But after that, we expanded the study to other types of tumors. Very quickly, this is the last publication of this year by Daniel Massot. He focused on triple negative breast cancer and in particular on metastatic cancer because he wanted to see whether we could have some effect on metastasis as well. So first, he showed that if we treated mice, uh, that had been implanted with triple negative breast cancer cells with omomic, we could have this effect on the primary tumors. Then he tried a prevention study. He pre-treated these cells for three days before injecting them in the tail vein of the animals. Normally, these cells seed and grow as lung metastasis. However, three days of pre-treatment with omomic make this difference that you can see here in the metastasis. They don't get any treatment while in vivo. So this is just the pre-treatment before the injection, okay? Then uh, Danny used uh, the same method to look at uh, primary and uh, uh, tumors and metastasis using also patient-derived xenograft. And the ESO that uh, 
this, um, this uh, therapeutic approach was also valid uh, in patient-derived samples. Um, recently, Trinicor in the lab also tried the colorectal cancer. Uh, she wanted to see whether we would have an effect, an equal effect in uh, KRAS mutant colorectal cancer versus KRAS wild type. And we were very surprised to see that the sensitivity seems to be exactly the same in the two contexts. So the KRAS mutation doesn't seem to make a difference in terms of sensitivity to homomic. This is a patient derived uh, xenograph treated only twice with homomic, so only two weeks of treatment. And uh, even so, we start seeing separation in the two cores. And we are very excited also by some results in the glioblastoma. By intranasal administration, I showed you that we could reach the brain of the animals. And uh, Jonathan and Laia did some experiments uh, looking at uh, orthotopic patient-derived xenograft uh, and uh, uh, treated these animals intranasally with omomic. The intranasal route bypasses the blood-brain barrier. So you can use it to bypass the blood-brain barrier. And we saw this nice therapeutic impact. However, again, when we started talking about intranasal administration, people told us that in oncology, that's not accepted yet. And the control of the dose can be complicated by the fact that different patients that have undergone, for example, chemo, have damage on the nasal mucosa. So it's not a, a preferred route of administration. So we recently switched to intracranial administration through osmotic pumps. So the surgeon in the hospital told us that very often the glioblastoma patients are, are uh, left with uh, administration of analgesics in the brain. So he said, why don't you take advantage of that route of administration? So we modeled this in mice with these pumps that can be implanted uh, subcutaneously at the back of their head. And so we can release amomic into the brain. And these are preliminary data, only two week treatment. As you can see, it's a very, very nice separation in this, uh, um, in the growth of these tumors. You can see it here. So we are trying to extend this to longer treatment. Very briefly, I'll, I'll try to wrap up. Silvia Casacuberta in the lab, has instead focused on this recruitment of uh, T cells uh, in the lung tumors after the administration with homomic. She wanted to see whether these T cells were active T cells or not, because the recruitment is not enough to have an anti-tumorigenic effect. She saw that with time, the T cells increased. This is one week, and this is four weeks. And you can see that the longer you treat with homomic, the more you recruit T cells. She characterized them and she saw that they are active. They're activated CD4 T cells, and they have a, a mixed Th1, Th17 phenotype. They produce interleukin 17 and interferon gamma. So they are doing their job here. She also saw recruitment of dendritic cells, so more antigen presentation locally. And she saw the appearance of T cells with a memory like phenotype which could be potential for protection from recurrence, recurrence or relapse of the tumors later on. She has also seen this after intravenous administration because the first observation was after the intranasal, but the intravenous administration does the same. So now we are doing some studies just combining gomomic with immune checkpoint inhibitors. Of course, for this, we are using human mice, and I hope to be able to show you that soon. So, Finishing, all along, our goal was to provide uh, a new viable therapeutic approach for cancer patients. And we wanted this new therapeutic approach to be less toxic than the current ones. So with Pertomic, we have been developing Omomic to the clinic. And the great news is that last year in May, we started a phase one to a clinical trial. So this is a, uh, clinical trial that include a phase one with all commerce solid tumors. Again, we hoped that Omomic could benefit as many tumor entities as possible. So we included all commerce. And uh, of course we looked at, uh, we have been looking at safety, but also preliminary signs of efficacy, everything that could tell us that something was working here. 
And uh, we are finishing the phase one. We are in the last dose level. So if everything goes well in summer, we will start phase two. At the moment, we had the big decision to make, which tumor entity. Given our preclinical data, we could pick a couple, but really everything was uh, giving us some encouraging results. So we based some of the decisions on the preliminary data of phase one. Remember in phase one, we have all the sorts of tumor entities. So our N for each tumor entity is really low. So it's, it's really a bet here. But we had some really, really nice results, which we didn't expect in pancreatic duct carcinoma. We had some patients that uh, got to the clinical trial that were very sick. They stay very long in the study, more than seven months of PDAC patient. So we are now including PDAC as an indication in phase two, something that we have not planned at all. We are thinking of including Kerasmutan non small cell lung cancer, Rasmutan colorectal cancer, and maybe we will add a small part of NIC amplified tumors. We don't need NIC amplification for this to, to work because KRAS induces tons of NIC, for example. EGFR induces tons of NIC. Yeah, the kinase induces a lot of NIC too. So we are doing this, the NIC amplified solid tumors because people expect it, investors expect it. But it's, it's just something that we are doing because of business reasons, really. And um, uh, with this, I just want to tell you that the safety of the drug is fantastic. It's what we saw in the mice. The patients are doing really great, something that always raises issues there because people expect a drug in oncology to work only if it has some toxicity. Well, we have some, but very, very mild, very mild. And with this, I would like to finish just thanking all the people that work on this. Uh, I always put together the people at Dio and at Peptonic because they really share the space in the lab and they work together on this project. And uh, I have to thank, of course, all the funding agencies that made this possible. Thank you. I'll be happy to take questions. Pues muchas gracias a vosotros.